This is Slow Food Live. My name is Giselle. Slow Food Live is a project of Slow Food USA. This is our way of bringing slow food into your home. And we have had the great luck of partnering with some really, really awesome publishers like Story, that's S-T-O-R-E-Y. And Stacy has published a book with Story called Winner, Winner, Chicken Dinner, which is a great title. <laughs> Stacy also has a podcast with a fantastic title called Didn't I Just Feed You? <laughs> um, so I'm going to let Stacy tell you more about herself. She's coming to us from Brooklyn, New York, and we're really happy to have Stacy. We are really grateful to Story Publishing for making this connection and bringing Stacy on to Slow Food Live. If you're not familiar with Slow Food, Slow Food is an international grassroots movement that advocates advocates for good, clean, and fair food for all. Um, I encourage you to check out Slow Food Online and learn more there if you're not sort of already in the mix. But I want to get us started on this chicken game. So I'm going to send this over to Stacy. Stacy, thank you so much for being here today. We are really happy to have you. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone out there. Guatemala, New Jersey, Oregon. And here I am in Brooklyn, New York, where strangely, recently we've been having amazing weather, <laughs> better than most of the country, uh, the US, which is really kind of rare for us. So reveling in that a little bit and enjoying our little backyards. So um, as Giselle said, I am Stacy Villas. I am author of Winner Winner Chicken Dinner. This is my most recent cookbook. Um, you know, when we first had the idea for this cookbook, I was like, I'm not so sure that I wanna write an entire cookbook about chicken. For me personally, as a food professional and recipe developer, I thought it might feel a little bit limiting. And then when I started doing research and finding out just how much chicken everybody is cooking, I realized that there was a problem to solve there. There was a way that I could be of service to busy, curious home cooks like all of you guys here today. And I decided to embark on the project and it's been so much fun. There are 50 chicken dinners in here. They're very flexible. I have, you know, I just had to go put two kids away. First day of remote school, I would like tuck them into their room so they could do homework and video games so that I could be here with you in some silence. So I know what it's like to be a busy home cook. And the idea was that this book could meet you where you are. You're already buying tons of chicken as your main protein. How can we make this exciting and interesting and kind of expand our horizons, but without making it too difficult or requiring you to buy too much stuff? You know, we wanted to be mindful of access and budgets so that everyone could really cook all of the dinners in this cookbook. I also wanted to make sure that people understood what they were buying, how to do better if that was something they were interested in, and how to maximize their chicken, both when it comes to budget and flexibility with cooking. So I am so excited for this today because breaking down your whole chicken is absolutely the best number one way to make the most of your grocery budget and to give you the maximum flexibility when it comes to cooking. So very excited about this today. One other quick note about me that Giselle mentioned is that I also have a podcast. It's called Didn't I Just Feed You? So you can tell I get really clever, or I think I get clever <laughs> with the naming of things. So my podcast is a weekly conversation with my co-host, who's also a food professional and recipe developer. Her name is Megan Splawn. We are two busy working moms. Our kids between us range from four years old to 13 years old. Can't believe I have a 13 year old, but I do. Um, and we just talk every week about the ins and outs and ups and downs of feeding a family. And you know, during quarantine, if any of you are feeding an entire family right now, I know, I see you, I hear that you are exhausted. So hopefully today we learn something that's fun, that's for us, that makes our cooking a little bit more satisfying and also just kind of easier and faster and we make the most of it. So without further ado, let's talk chicken. I'm the chicken lady. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about everything that I have here, right? I have the chicken and we'll talk about that in a second, but let's also talk about our equipment. So I have a cutting board. This is a big question that I get a lot. What's the right cutting board? Um, really, there are so many options right now. 
that the best, easiest, quickest answer is that whatever cutting board is made of the hardest material you can find is the best one to go with. So when it comes to wood, it's maple or beech, but now there are all these synthetic plastics and pressed ones, as long as it's hard. Because the idea is that bacteria is gonna fester with moisture in all the little crevices. So you want something that isn't gonna get knife marked super, super easily because that's when it's gonna be hard to disinfect and hard to clean. Um, and no matter what material your cutting board is made of, you wanna make sure that as soon as, it, as soon as it's really knife marked up, that you get a new one. Another really, really common question is, should I get a dedicated meat cutting board? And I say yes. I think that's the safest, easiest thing for you to do. I do not disinfect my cutting board every single time I cut chicken on it, but I do run it through the dishwasher, and that does it for me. Um, the most important thing when you run it through the dishwasher, or if you're washing it by hand, um, if you really do want to disinfect it, which, is, which whether that's after every use or every five uses, you're going to use about a gallon of water and a tablespoon of bleach. That will do the trick. But the key is, no matter how you've washed it, that afterwards you want to make sure to dry it. Even if it's come out of the dishwasher. You know it has little droplets? Dry those off with your dish towel by hand. Because again, moisture is your biggest enemy here when it comes to keeping your cutting board safe and sanitary. So if you guys have any other questions on cutting boards, just pop them in, Giselle will interrupt me. I can always talk more about it, answer your questions. But now let's talk about our equipment. So a boning knife is, is it an important thing to have? A butcher will tell you yes. But I live in New York City and I'm lucky enough, like this space that you see me in is a big kitchen by New York City standards, but I really do not have a lot of space. And so I try to keep a minimalist kitchen as much as possible. So I have found that just having a chef's knife uh, 10 or 12 inches will do, and a paring knife is gonna be enough for this kind of butchering, and honestly, for most home butchering. So that's good enough. If you have a boning knife, that's great. You can pull that out too and use that for most of the things that you find me using my chef's knife for. And the only different difference is, I wonder if I can show you in the book, we have a picture, is that the tip gets curved a little bit and thinner, which helps you do a little bit more detail work. So here you go. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's your boning knife and that's your chef's knife. So today I'm just going to use the chef's knife and the paring knife. And we're going to do that because I want you to know it's really, really important to me in all of my work that I'm really serving like the average home cook. You know, if you have great skills, if you're very practiced and, you know, you're like wanting to be an amateur chef, that's awesome. But I really want to make sure that even home cooks that feel really insecure, really unsure of themselves can get in the kitchen with whatever they have and just practice and get good at it because that's all it is. It's not about special equipment. It's not about, you know, having some certain skill that you can't develop. It's just about getting in there being a little bit fearless and just practicing. And actually, that reminds me, since we can't have like the same back and forth that we would in live, a live event, um, it reminds me, I'm gonna tell a little story that I was going on live TV once and I was working with a culinary producer, segment producer. And we were like batting around ideas for what I should do on the segment on the show. And I was like, oh, what about breaking down a whole chicken? And he was like, nope because the one, there are two things I've seen professional chefs mess up over and over on live television. One is trussing a chicken, which is a whole other story. Maybe slow moves will have me come back on that. You know, that it gets all turned around and nobody knows what's happening. And the other is breaking down a chicken. Because unless you're a butcher and just doing it every day and it's just secondhand for you, you know, you just kind of muddle through it and it's okay. I'm gonna show you how to muddle through it very, very gracefully so that you can get it done quickly and easily. All right, so we talked about our chef's knife, our paring knife, and then these. 
I love these. These are specifically poultry shears. So if you have kitchen shears, regular ones, you're, they're gonna be a little bit lightweight. If they're in good shape, they will work for what we're doing today. But if you're gonna be breaking down chickens as a matter of course, you wanna really make this a habit in your kitchen life, I would invest in some poultry shears. They're not very expensive, they're heavy duty, and they will do a lot of that like grunt work for you so that you don't have to really struggle with it. So that's what we have with equipment. Um, I don't know, do we have any questions about equipment coming in? If not, there is, there is one question, oh, okay. and I'm, I am going to interject very quickly here to ask the question, and then I'll add a couple more comments before we keep going. How, what do you think about a glass cutting board? A glass cutting board? Do you know that I've never used one? That's so interesting. I mean, listen, a glass cutting board is going to be really easy to clean. The deal <laughs> with cutting boards is making sure that your knife is well taken care of. And I wonder if glass actually would be good for your knives. My guess is that it might be hard on your knives. Marble is good, but normally for baking, it also has a little bit of give and softness. But as far as keeping it sanitary, if you have a glass cutting board and you love it and it works for you and your knives, then you know running it through the dishwasher should take care of sanitizing it one, two, three. Awesome. I do remember my parents had this like strange Maybe it was a cutting board, but it was glass, but they always use it to sort of present food or <laughs> yes. as a serving platter. But I, I had the same thought about the knives. The next question I, I think we can come back to later is maybe about how you sharpen your tools. Um, oh, yeah. That's they, great. Uh, and actually, I'm very happy that that came up because we can come back to it. But I will say that because in New York City, we've been like home since early spring, I haven't been able to get my knives sharpened. Well, I'll just, I'll just fill you in right now. <laughs> Basically, after every single use, I hand wash them. I dry them thoroughly because water will degrade the um, sharpness of the edge. So I wipe it very thoroughly with my dish towel and then I hone it. I personally hone after every single use. So um, let's grab my hone stick since we're here and we're talking about it. Pull it out just about a 45 degree angle, a couple of swipes on each side, and that's it. And then I would say every six to 12 months, depending on how much you use your knife, its quality, um, what shape it was in when you started, you'll want to get it sharpened. Or you can get, you know, a sharpener yourself. I don't keep a sharpener in my house. Again, minimalist kitchen. I'm not going to have another thing. I'd rather just go out every six months and get it sharpened. And there's something just like very, very charming or cool about having a knife sharpener. <laughs> it's like yes. a, a cobbler. <laughs> very <Totally>. special skill. <laughs> um, totally. great. One more question on the poultry shears. Do you sharpen your poultry shears? Do you take that to the same place? I don't sharpen my poultry shears, but I have to tell you that I've gone through quite a number yeah. of these <laughs> because when I was doing the cookbook, I was experimenting with different versions of it. So um, if your poultry shears get dull, absolutely take them to get sharpened. Let's save money and keep reusing our stuff as long as we can. Yes, totally. Okay, great. Thank you, Stacy. And then I'm yeah, going to interject with a couple comments, which is one, I have this great book right here, which I did get to flip through and it's awesome. Um, and we'll be giving away this copy at some point during today's session. So stay tuned. And then the other thing I want to mention is that I will send a follow-up email to all of you after the session is over with a recording of this session and some of the things that Stacy is mentioning, like some equipment lists, links to follow Stacy online, to grab the book online, that sort of thing. So don't worry too much about taking notes. I'm taking notes for you and we'll follow up later so you can see this again when you're in your kitchen breaking down a chicken if you're not doing it right now. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. And thanks. also, I want to say that I'm kind of a sucker for being online and answering people's questions and engaging, especially in quarantine. I miss you guys. I miss being out there in person. So I am at Stacy Billis. I'm sure Giselle will share it, but that's where I am on Instagram. Also, Didn't I Just Feed You has an Instagram presence, a Facebook presence, and I'm in all of those places answering questions. So I always like to say, like, if you come up with a question later that you want to ask me, you know how to find me. All right, so now let's talk about our actual chicken. Let's do like a little bit of a, you know, I'm kind of curious, Giselle and I were talking about this. I think she threw out the question in the beginning. 
where are you guys buying your chickens? Are you getting them at the farmer's market? Is there a farm that raises chickens that you know of at the regular supermarket, conventional supermarket? Um, are you like making a distinction between organic, all natural, conventionally grown? I mean, listen, wherever you are getting your meat, you know, do your thing. For me, it's very important that people don't feel judged by food professionals. I feel like there's way too much of that. I will say though, having done an entire cookbook on chickens <laughs> and having tasted many, many chickens from all different places, that chickens that come from farms that are raised to truly free range, that are you know fed a grain diet that those chickens tend to taste better i also want to make a note about water weight in air chilled versus water chilled i always recommend to stick with a three to four pound whole chicken or smaller smaller gets a little bit skimpy but anything that's much higher like a five pound chicken you're talking about a chicken that's been given either growth hormones or maybe was chilled in water and is retaining a lot of water weight and it's just the meat just isn't as flavorful so you know your values are your values they don't have to be my values we don't have to be on exactly the same page but we all like our food to taste good so that's just something that i want you to consider and if this kind of thing is interesting to you i know giselle has a bunch of resources with their um slow foods meat community um also in winter winter chicken dinner i talk a little bit more about it in some detail so you can read up on that but you want to start with a three to four pound chicken. Okay, let's get a little bit of a tour of here. So when the legs and the wings are tucked like this, and you can really feel and see the backbone, that's what you've got here. You've got the backbone, this is where the neck was. And when you flip it over and the legs and the wings start to splay and you have a more meaty part right here, that's the breast. So in a lot of my directions in the book, because I do have this in winter, winter chicken dinner with step-by-step -step instructions and step-by-step -step photos, you know, you'll read a lot of times breast side up. So that's really how you can tell. This is the backbone, the legs are tucked, but you flip it over and as soon as everything splays, you know your breast side up. This is the meaty part, okay? So let's, now that we're kind of oriented, want to make sure we pat down our chicken first because moisture is the enemy of crispy skin and everybody wants the skin on their chicken crispy. And if not, let's have a conversation. You see, I told you where to find me. <laughs> you need to talk if you don't agree with that. So you want to pat it down. You may even want to pat it down inside. And depending on where you get your chicken, you might find that the giblets are inside in a little package. So my cavity is empty, but always check inside the cavity as well. All right, let's move all of our equipment and get started here. So breast side up, we're gonna start with the legs facing me, the cavity, so this is um, the neck cavity, open towards me. And you can really start with the wings or the legs, but I have come to like, you know, in the book, I recommended that you start with the wings, but I have changed my mind on this. I kind of go back and forth. So it really doesn't matter either way. We're gonna start by taking the legs off. Now here's the thing. This skin right here where the leg meets the breast and the body of the chicken is just, the, there's a lot of air there. You're just gonna gently with your knife cut so that you can open it up. Right now, I haven't cut through any flesh. I haven't cut through any bone. I'm just kind of opening it up here. I'm gonna do the same thing on this side. Just make a slit and it's just gonna open right up. You wanna get down there. You see good, Mike? Mm -hmm. Cameraman Mike? Okay. Cameraman Mike says thumbs up. <laughs> okay, so all we've done so far is cut the skin just a little bit. Now what we're gonna do is grab the legs and we're gonna use the weight of the chicken to just, ooh, that was a beautiful was one. A one. <laughs> to just pop the bone right out. And here's what this does. Do you, can you see the bone right there? It just popped right out. And what that does is it shows me exactly where the socket is. So here's the deal with breaking down a chicken. You're not really supposed to be cutting through bone. Now, 
we will. We're going to cut your bone a little bit because we're just beginners, right? And like, we're never going to always find that right exact spot. But the idea is to cut right between where the joint meets the socket. There's a little space there. And when you get into that space, it cuts very, very easily. And even if you're a little bit off, it's very easy. So when you're breaking down a chicken for your first time or your first 10 times, honestly, <laughs> that's what you're looking for. And a lot of times that just requires you to kind of play around and articulate the pieces that can really help you find out where that joint is. But with this first move, we've popped it out and we can see. And now I'm gonna turn the chicken a little bit so you guys can hopefully see better. Just gonna take the knife and cut right where that joint was. There we go. All that extra skin, skin is good. So see, we cut right in between there. You can see a full intact joint. So on this side, and it really depends. Sometimes you have to like dig a little and it's a little bit, um, you have to maneuver because it's a little bit deep in the cavity. Just cut right there, right in between where we see the joint, where we popped that joint. I said, like I said, my knives aren't the sharpest, but right there, cut right through it. Okay, so let's actually, I should have gotten a little pan out here so we can move. Let's move the pieces onto a cookie sheet. So we don't argue. Let's just get a plate so we can go fast. Just want to move these off so that you guys can see. So right now we have a leg quarter. This is what it's called. That's the thigh connected to the leg, the drumstick. We will split these as well, but sometimes you want to cook with just this. So one of the awesome things about breaking down a chicken, if you have a family, if you have kids, if you have a recipe that calls just for drumsticks, you get much more control. Buying two whole chickens is so much more affordable than buying six to eight drumsticks or something like that. And then you break it up, you have a lot of flexibility, you get multiple meals, or you can roast the whole chicken in parts instead of roasting it whole, which gives you a little bit more control over the cooking time. And on top of it, you get the backbone, which is the like bonus here, because the backbone is how you can make a very small or bigger if you break down multiple chickens at once, pot of stock, of homemade stock. So we'll talk about that afterwards. Okay, we are still breast side up. We've taken off the leg quarters. Let's do the wings next. For the wings, we're gonna prop the chicken on its side. And again, it's all about articulation. The wings are actually the hardest part because sometimes the joint is a little bit deep. So really, I wanna encourage you to like move things around and really find where is that joint? It's somewhere in here. And you can, I'm gonna take my paring knife for this, a smaller knife. And again, you can just cut the skin a little bit without going too deep, just so you can get a peek inside. So you see, I look, I put my finger, where is that joint? It's right about in here. Yep. And then it's just really easy when you get it. And with the wing, you're literally gonna just turn it around, keep turning and cut it free. And you're going to use the weight of the chicken body. There we go. Wing. You can see I got right there. The joint is nice and clean. Got right in that socket. If you're going to cook the wings, I like to cut off the tips myself. And that's literally just look for that little joint and just pop it clean. There we go. Put the little wing tip aside. Let's do the other wing. Again, prop it on its side, articulate, try to find where you think that joint is. Use a little, a knife, go gentle at first so you can just kind of see what's happening in there. Someone asked why you cut the wing tip. Why you cut the wing tip? There's really no meat on that. You can cut it, if you love that like crispy skin and bone situation, keep it on and let it get really charred and yummy. There we go. Wing, wing tip. It's just really, it's literally just bone. Although there is some good skin there, so I don't know. You do a good job of getting it nice and crisp. We have a wing. Okay. 
Now, what we have here is a birdless, actually kind of sad, a legless, wingless chicken. That's okay. We're gonna take out the backbone and get to the meatiest part soon. So here's another great thing about chickens. A lot of times the fat lines will guide you. So what we wanna do now is take out the backbone. Again, we wanna do the cavity towards me. This time we want backbone up. So it's going to be resting on that meaty breast. And when you look on the side here, can you see, Mike, can you see this fat line? Yes. Great. That's where we're going to cut first on each side. It's literally a guide, right? So just cut right there. Now the other one is on this side. You see it right here? Yeah. Can you get Let me it? Get close. Okay. Just literally cut right there. We're halfway at taking the backbone out. And now you're gonna use a little bit of force and cut the rest of it out. Just go straight from where that fat line led you. Backbone. This, friends, this is the prize. This is why you work to break down a chicken. You throw this in a pot with whatever, half of an onion with the skin still on, a couple of carrots, a couple of celery stalks, maybe some peppercorns if you're fancy or a bay leaf. You cover it with two inches of water, you let it simmer for two hours on the stove, and you end up with a small batch of stock. If you have two of these, because you're breaking down two chickens, all the better, you just have more. And that's a beautiful thing to have that on hand. So that's what you use this for. All right, now we have the breast. We're just gonna basically split it and guys, we've done it, we're done, okay? So I'm gonna show you how to do this with the bone still in because that's how I prefer it. I find it much easier to cook a chicken evenly when the bone is still in, a breast in particular, when the bone is still in and then it's so easy to pull off the bone if that's what you want. But if you are going to be making something that calls for boneless, skinless chicken breasts, you can still use a whole chicken. You'd use the parts for one thing. And then the way you would do that, I'm just going to kind of mimic it for now. You can see that this line is a little bit darker right down the middle. That's cartilage. And it's quite soft, actually. So this takes a little perfecting to hug the cartilage. But basically, all you're going to do is kind of cut right down alongside of it. The tricky part is that cartilage is soft, just like the flesh. So you might cut into the cartilage and not get a clean line at first, but that's okay. It's really easy to fix with a paring knife. So again, if you wanted to do that, you would just turn it with the wide side facing you, go on the side of the cartilage and cut, 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 and cut around until the breast just comes free. And then to take off the skin, you literally just take your fingers and pull the skin off. But let's do this with the bone in. I'm gonna turn it over. And you can see up here, the V is the um, wishbone. I'm just gonna give it a little cut to kind of give me a little bit of a head start here so I don't have to press so hard when I'm butchering. I also like to, to press down on it because I want to get mass, maximum breakage naturally. And then literally just put my knife down the middle and cut. There we go. Oh, this knife, I want it to be sharper and it's not, but that doesn't matter. And that's what I want you guys to see. Look, beautiful. So you can see if I'm a perfectionist, <laughs> like there are a few little ragged pieces here because my knife isn't perfectly sharp, but that's hardly anything. You just want to press right through there and then you've got a beautiful bone in, skin on breast. Again, pulling the skin off is as simple as just going in with your fingers and yanking it off. That's it. And then some people have asked if they should cut the breast in half. And absolutely you can do that. Sometimes when you're grilling in particular, I find that it is pulled right off. I find that it makes for easier cooking. And I, you know, there's really no, literally you just wanna go like that and cut. And then you have two halves. 
But if you really want to look, you can see that the heavy bones are right here. And if you cut right underneath like that, you're going to get about two even sized pieces. So you guys, there you go. We did it. Oh no, wait, I forgot. We want to split the leg quarters. We said we'd get back to that. So now that we have everything else, if you want to split these leg quarters, remember what I told you about the fat line? Same difference here. This line right here, which pretty much divides the thigh from the leg, is your guide. Now this is another one like the wings where, you know, be easy on yourself at first. Kind of move it around. See if you can figure out where that joint is moving, where it's separate. And I think it's right there. Yep. I got it. And cut right through it. And there you go. You have a drumstick and you have a thigh. Bone in, skin on, totally delicious. So that, you guys, is how you break down a chicken. And I dragged that out so long, honestly. When you get the hang of this, it takes five minutes. And then you can freeze it, you can cook it, you can make some stock, but it just really, really maximizes your budget. And that's what I love about this most. So do you guys have questions? I'm gonna wash my hands. Cool. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, thanks everyone for your questions and for also throwing into the chat where you get your chicken from. Um, I put a little note in here that sort of the slow food approach to me is better meat, less meat. That's kind of what we talk about um, and really encourage people to explore your own community to see who out there has whole chicken. I know that for me, it became much cheaper when I started buying whole chicken frozen from a local producer. Plus I get to have this nice little farmer's market interaction every time I do. Um, so thanks for letting us know where, like I see a lot of you are getting them from CSAs and that's awesome. Some delivery that's happening, Great. that's awesome. So um, check out the Slow Meat page that I put a link into if you wanna learn a little more about that from the Slow Food perspective. Um, we do have questions, Stacy. so let's jump right into them. Great. I, one of my questions for you, which you kind of just answered is, when this is the thing that I run into is I get a frozen chicken, I thought I break it down, and then I'm like, I don't want to make the whole thing right now necessarily. There's only two people in my house. So you said you can freeze it, you can cook it. What about putting a couple pieces in the fridge? How long might you keep it in the fridge? Or do you really just go straight to the freezer on that if you're not going to use it right away? If it's already been frozen, I would not refreeze it. Once you thaw it, I would cook it within two to three days. Um, if it's not pre-frozen, you're just breaking it down like this chicken I just got today, preparation for you guys. So if I were to not cook this, it's actually going to become dinner tonight. <laughs> but if I were not to cook everything now, I would say like absolutely wrap it up three to five days, you know, keep your refrigerators a little bit colder than you think. You can look it up and the coldest of the range that they give is really where you want your fridge to be to keep everything super fresh. Um, but I will say, I'm a huge, not Giselle, not to like push you, <laughs> but I'm a huge proponent of cooking chicken for leftovers, mm -hmm. huge. So, you know, if you're gonna make that chicken broth, you know, sometimes I just can't and I'll put it in a pot and I'll put a lid, keep it in the fridge and make the broth the very next day, you know, if I'm just too tired at night. But if you're going to make that broth, once you strain the broth, throw in whatever chicken parts you haven't used and poach the chicken, you know, in the broth that you just made, it'll be mm. super flavorful. And I feel like, you know, shredded, simply cooked chicken, whether poached, which is such an easy thing to do, or roasted or even just like quickly cooked in a pan is such a great thing to have around for lunches, for packed lunches, school lunches, for quick easy dinners, tostadas, chicken pot pies, tacos, you know, just endless, endless options. So I even have a, a chapter in here called like creating and using leftovers because I really believe when it comes to chicken, it's such a versatile protein that creating leftovers for yourself is really like a gift to your future self in the kitchen. 
Absolutely. I was just thinking I've never been unhappy that I cooked the whole thing and then had leftovers in the fridge. They don't last long because my husband is also a proponent of cooking it all for leftovers, but they're gone in the morning. Um, great. Thank you for that. While you have the chicken in front of you, um, Tracy has asked, nope, Larissa has asked if you could show how to debone the thigh. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I have a thigh right here. Now, Again, be kind with yourself. This is really a matter of just like practicing. And again, this is a part where having a boning knife really is the way to go. I'm gonna use my paring knife. And again, I actually wonder if um, we have a sharper one for me. This one, I'm not liking how sharp it is. Let's try this one. I always, I always have many knives. I travel with them when I've traveled before. So, okay, literally all you're gonna do is cut out the bone. <laughs> like there's no fancy trick here. So when you turn it over, it's pretty obvious where the bone is, right? And you just want to hug the bone and kind of make short little cuts so that you can free the bone without really like cutting too much into the chicken meat itself. And the great thing about a boning knife in this case is because it's curved, I showed that to you guys earlier, it's just really easy to get in there. But that's it, like we're just gonna keep doing this until that bone comes free. Let's do this side. And then you're literally gonna just pull it out. Can you see, Mike? I know this is like yep. detail work. <laughs> there you go. But there's no like crazy science to this. So once you kind of get it going on each side, to get underneath it, you can kind of lift it upright like that so that you can get in there. There we go. And cut it right off, cut it free. There we go. Get through that last bit. Because the other thing is that you may find, like I found just right here, a little bit of like shards. You always, when you are cutting or breaking down a chicken yourself, always check for little pieces of bone. You can just kind of feel them. And here we go. We have a boneless skin on, uh, thigh rather. And again, you would just pull the skin off. I think I showed that once enough. <laughs> it's Don't not... take that skin off. <laughs> Sad to take the skin off. So that's what he said because this is dinner tonight and he wants the skin off. <laughs> so you can do that with this. But again, if you were looking for a boneless chicken breast, you would actually break down the breast differently than we did. So we cut through the cartilage not as so easy to see but you can see here the bone is right there and we just want to run the knife alongside that freeing this breast kind of the way we did the thigh if that makes sense yeah i think so makes sense thank you i feel like we're all learning some knife skills right now too <laughs> <laughs> too for um excellent so i dare say we have some some parents in the audience there are more than one person has asked what part of the chicken you might make chicken tenders from. Yes, I love <laughs> this. We have, Megan and I did an entire episode of Didn't I Just Feed You called um, like bringing back the chicken nugget. And you know, we just talked about how much we love chicken nuggets in any form. <laughs> and I'm a really huge proponent of homemade breaded chicken cutlets. We really took like a loose interpretation of chicken nugget. Um, Megan always has some frozen chicken nuggets from the store in her freezer. Um, I admitted on that episode that I had never had a frozen chicken nugget at home. And I really got, I got, kind of made fun of for that. <laughs> I'm not against them. I just love homemade chicken cutlets. So you're going to want to make that. That's like a tender at the supermarket, right? The more butchered the cut is, 
the more you're going to pay for it because you're paying for the butcher's labor pretty much. So chicken tenders are basically just cut up boneless, skinless chicken breast. So, you know, I here, I'm going to do something a little bit. This is not what you're supposed to do. If we had had this, if we had butchered this so that it was um, boneless and skinless, I wouldn't have had to cut that piece out. But here we have a piece of boneless, skinless chicken breast. First of all, when it's whole, you'll see that as you unfold it, there's always that one long piece there that unfolds. That's a chicken tender. Sometimes you can even, with just a fresh chicken, pull it off and you'll have a piece of chicken tender. It'd be longer if we were working with the whole breast, you would just cut it in half. And then just, you know, cut chicken tenders like that. Just like that. You know, another thing that you can do if you really wanna get fancy, is you can grind your own chicken or you store-bought ground chicken and then you can shape chicken nuggets. That's a little bit more like what you might find in the store. Um, but when you break down your own chicken, you can also just grind it in a food processor. I have a recipe in Winner Winner Chicken Dinner where it's a chicken thigh ragu. And I just really found that using the food processor at home was the easiest, most affordable way to do this. And it just takes a couple of pulses. So for chicken nuggets, I would take a combination of thigh meat and um, breast meat. And I would just pulse it in the food processor and then form it and then bread it and do your thing. Perfect. Thanks, Stacy. All right, we have a few questions about, you know, after the chicken is cooked or cooking the chicken in recipe. So before I ask those questions, I'm gonna say that there are 80, 80 people in this webinar. And so I'm gonna put all of you into sort of a, a hat, <laughs> a, a digital hat to pull for the giveaway to grab the book. But just to color this giveaway a little bit, let us know in the chat what your favorite chicken dinner is, preferably like how you use a whole chicken, all the pieces of a chicken. So Stacy's book has 50 recipes for chicken dinner, which is amazing. And they look really good. <laughs> Every time I open the book, I get stuck on one page because I'm just like, oh, well, this looks fantastic. So let us know in the chat what your favorite chicken dinner is, maybe what your go-to chicken dinner is if you have kids at home or there's just a couple people at home or it's just you. How do you like to use a whole chicken? Um, and then I will pull at the after this session, I'll pull a name from all the folks who have joined us on the webinar today so we can grab a winner for the book. Um, I don't know what's happening. All I know is that my cameraman, aka husband, is going like, ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you guys are saying, apparently it's good. Do I need to like write another volume? <laughs> I mean, maybe. There might be a sequel based on some feedback, but I, I have a feeling there's some of these that are, are echoed in your book. So there's a, there, we have lemon roasted chicken, chicken curry, salt and pepper, chicken marbella from a silver oh. palace cookbook, green chili chicken enchiladas, Classic. love that. Lemon and fennel roasted chicken, that sounds amazing. Chicken adobo, which I think you do have sort of a version of that in here. I Adobo's do. Pollo, chicken pot pie, yum. Um, green curry chicken, chicken, awesome. Grandma's recipe with flour the pieces and saute them, excellent. There are some, now I'm getting hungry suddenly, so I'm gonna- I know, I'm, I'm hungry too. <laughs> bring my and it's so <laughs> funny because the question that I get asked most is, did you get sick and tired of cooking and eating chicken? <laughs> you know, when you're writing a cookbook, you get sick and tired of cooking anything for a while, but I'm shocked honestly shocked at how we didn't get tired of eating chicken. We kept making jokes about it and like saying like, oh, we're so tired of it. But then I'd serve up another chicken dish and everybody's like, mm, yummy. And we <laughs> never, even once I was done with the book, I typically will like stop making something that I've been developing for a while so that I can return to it like later because we're all tired of eating it many times over as I test the recipe. But we just rolled right through continuing eating chicken. Love chicken. <laughs> I love that. And when you have a whole repertoire of chicken recipes, I feel like chicken is a really versatile protein. So when you know what totally. to do with it, you can go so many different directions. Um, Joanne has mentioned that when she breaks down a chicken and she just uses one piece, like breast or thighs, that she doesn't end up having enough for her family. And I think that one of the things I notice in your book is that it's how to take these pieces or, or if you're just using one piece and build a meal out of it. So I don't know if you wanna to speak to that point a little bit about how to use the chicken as part of your meal and not necessarily the whole meal or how to make just the breast or just the thighs work for the whole family. Totally. 
So when I break down a whole chicken, it's typically to save money. And then mostly my preparation is either like grilling the whole bird, because I like grilling in pieces. I do love a spatchcock chicken, which is when you only take out the backbone. And you would pretty much do that just with your, you know, your poultry shears. You take the whole bird, you get that spine and you have it face up and you just cut right through and then flatten it. But otherwise, I find that chicken parts grilled or roasting it like that, the way I would a whole bird. So whatever flavoring, someone mentioned fennel that's beautiful, like olives, whole lemons, rubbing it with butter and herbs. Um, if I'm going to make a recipe that calls for just like my chicken proper crush, calls for leg quarters. So again, a leg quarter is the thigh and the leg still connected. Um, then I'll buy two birds, I'll break it down, and then I'll have four breasts, which is enough for one meal. I'll have four leg quarters, which is enough for another meal, and I'll kind of meal plan around it like that. Um, so I don't, does that answer the question? Because I do agree that also one bird, I have a 13-year-old, a 10-year-old. The 13-year-old I think we've determined is like maybe already five, nine-ish. Mike, the camera guy, is 6'4", and we all have huge appetites. So one, like, three and a half to four pound bird definitely, like, on its own isn't quite enough. But it was like you were saying earlier, Giselle, like, eat higher quality meat less often. Like, thinking a lot about the balance um, that whether it's chicken or any meat, or even pasta, like I love pasta, but just shift playing with balance, like adding more vegetables and beans to less pasta to fill up the meal is something that I try to do just to kind of keep healthy, make one chicken stretch for an entire meal or two chickens across at least two meals. Um, you know, so thinking about those sides and making sure that you're using all of the parts so you don't waste anything. Excellent. Perfect. Um, that is a nice segue into another question, which is maybe a little bit outside of the topic, but how to get it. So in a lot of cultures, the, every piece of the chicken is used, the feet, the neck, all of it. Um, yeah. How might I get a hold of all those pieces? Because as we know, chickens are not sold in their entirety <laughs> very often, except for like in my case, going straight to the producer. Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, and I live in Brooklyn, New York, we have tons of amazing food producers and butchers, is to go directly to your butcher. Um, most butchers these days, I think, are whole animal butchers, but that's like a thing. So you might want to call ahead of time and ask, are you a whole animal butcher? That means that they're getting in the whole animal and they're breaking it down so that they can put aside for you whatever it is you need. Um, I think visiting ethnic markets is another great place to explore. Again, you know, I understand that access is different in all different places. Um, but if you live in a big city, like New York City, we can go to a Chinese market, a Japanese market, a Greek market, a Middle Eastern market, a halal butcher. So a lot of times that's a great place. Um, farmers markets sometimes you might need to call the farm like if you go to the farmers market you see which farm is selling the chickens get their number or speak to the farmer directly or whoever's working their stand and ask them so you might do need to do a little bit of planning ahead but i would say you know ethnic food markets whole animal butchers and farms just as however you can get directly to a farmer that's your best bet Excellent. That's perfect. And this reminds me of a story my dad told me grew up in San Francisco in the 50s and 60s and used to go on butcher runs for his mom. And I think his mom liked to cook a particular part of the chicken that wasn't sold. It wasn't even in the case. And so he just asked, you know, and yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, we have tons of them in the back. We'll sell them to you for a very good price. You know, if it's a whole animal butcher, they're going to have them. They might not be in the case, but just ask for them, I think. Absolutely. And the thing is that typically they'll use those parts to make stock. A lot of butchers you find will like sell their own stock. Like they're going to try to make use of it to make money off of it and to reduce waste. So they're always going to be happy to sell that to you. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and, and demand increases availability. So just keep talking to your food producers. <laughs> um, 
And speaking of stock, it is a good question. Is there a difference between stock and broth? There is a difference between stock and broth. So broth is actually without the, it's just clear. It's without the meat, without anything. It's basically like soup. And, and stock is when you're really like cooking it down and using it to use in other things. But they're used pretty interchangeably, to be completely honest. So in the cookbook, I do differentiate. So again, the broth is making a quick, clear broth without anything. You can add some of that poached chicken you made before or leftover rotisserie chicken that you have to make a quick soup. And then a stock is gonna have a deeper, richer flavor. And I have a regular stock and a dark stock. And dark stock is made by roasting the bones first. And that's another great reason to break down your own chicken. So I also have a recipe for how you can adapt, you know, stock that comes in the box. And also if you roast a whole chicken, you eat it all up and then you're left with the carcass, a lot of people will wanna make stock out of that. That's great, but that's not actually stock. And what you need to know there is that when you've already cooked the chicken on the bone, the bone has already steamed. And a stock that has a good, deep, rich, delicious flavor, you want that bone itself to roast. So if it's already steamed, you know, then it doesn't have that great flavor. You're gonna get something really like light and thin, which again, works for some things. But, you know, in the book, I really try to differentiate stock and broth, again, a dark broth and a regular broth, and then how to doctor whatever it is you have on hand. Because sometimes you just, that's what you have. You have a leftover carcass and you wanna make use of it. So I wanted to make sure that people could do something with it to reduce their waste and to make as much use of their chicken parts as possible. Excellent, thanks. That sounds fantastic, a dark breath. I have never done that. So. It's really good. You know when you see that dark brown yeah. stock? That's what's happening. We're roasting the bones first to make a really deep, rich flavor. I love doing it in the winter. It stands up to hearty dishes really, really well. So it's a great thing to use. You know, I tend to use chicken stock even for like a beef stew. Not always, you know, it really depends. But chicken stock is like my workhorse in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So when you want to use it all purpose for a beef stew, for a chili, you know, that darker stock is going to give you tons of great flavor. Excellent. Thank you. And one last question with just enough time to get it in is in cutting down, in breaking down a cooked chicken, would you use the same sort of process you just did? Absolutely, that's a really great question. You would, you'd cut off the legs first, you can pluck the wings off, and then you cut right down the breast in the middle. You're not gonna take out the backbone the same way, you're just gonna cut through it. Um, either like that, or if you want like beautiful, like sliced, breast the way you would at um, Thanksgiving, like with the turkey, you'll just, the same way I talked about looking for the cartilage, if we were going to make this boneless, skinless, I talked about just cutting really close to the cartilage on each side so you can free the meat. That's what you would do with the cooked meat. And actually, it's a little bit easier once the meat is cooked. Excellent. But again, in winter, winter chicken dinner, we have step-by-step -step instructions for that also, <laughs> like how to carve a cooked bird. So really this, I really, really wanted this book to be like your chicken handbook, but I didn't want to make this big, heavy tome that wasn't accessible to people who were just beginning, to people who wanted to elevate their skill a little bit, but actually they're super busy and they're not in the business of like studying butchery. <laughs> so even though it's this thin, fun, colorful book of chicken dinners, I do have a ton of information in here on breaking it down, how to buy it. We talked about that a little bit labels, organic, antibiotic free. So everything you need to know as a casual but serious home cook is in the book. Excellent. I was just going to say this book strikes me as one of those like everything you need and nothing you don't. <laughs> yes, I love that.
Yes, and I love that kind of cookbook, especially if it's focused on one particular ingredient. I think that's the way to go. Um, Stacy, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I, now I just want nothing but chicken for dinner. <laughs> so remember that I'm going to give away this copy of this book, and then I'll go run and get my own copy. Um, and I will send you that follow-up email soon and announce the winner there. So right after you get that email, if you are not the winner, go grab that book or just go grab it right now. We can always pass it on to someone else. <laughs> I'm sure your friend or your neighbor or your mom or your sister want a copy, your brother. <laughs> um, I want to make one quick comment. Thank you for joining on Slow Food Live. There are many of you who have joined many, many Slow Food Lives. This is the last Slow Food Live. I will be in front of this bookshelf which has received sort of some of its own fandom and so thank you for your enthusiasm around this this home built bookshelf i will be back next thursday with another author from story i will be in a different place um, we are learning to make mochi next thursday so i'm really excited about that um, again story publishing is bringing us like such amazing authors and such amazing skills um, so we hope you'll join us for that. Thank you for joining us today. Stacy. thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you and best of luck. Thank you, everybody.